Well, hello again, guys. This is Christian Bassar with another episode of History Vice Video Blog, the 11th episode now. So, I just wanted to start with that quote at the beginning there, because it's very pertinent to this 11th episode. So, um, the what I'm talking about here is ideas, of course, and uh, not the C CBC radio show. Although that that is fairly interesting if you're in Canada and you listen to that. It's a, it's a fairly interesting show. But anyway... Uh, well, that's the very point. We have an entire show about ideas, philosophy, and um, how it affects people. So, exactly the point. So, but in 1917, there was the idea of communism that took down the Tsar of Russia. And this Tsar um, institution, or the monarchy there, was had existed for centuries. So, you know, and of course the idea of communism didn't originate in 1917. But that's when the revolution happened. So, and of course, after the Tsar was removed and Russia became the Communist Soviet Union, uh, so communism spread across good parts of Eurasia, and then um, it, and in its name, whole societies were, were changed. Like everything became uh, like a collective agriculture, collective industries, and so on. And unfortunately, a lot of people um, died because of that, uh, of, of starvation and, um, and those kinds, of, with that kind of collectivization. And, and so we see that ideas have a consequence, especially when you consider that the, on the other side of the spectrum, you have capitalism. So both sides were, of course, Russia and uh, US, and US didn't fight each other directly during the Cold War, which took most of the latter half of the 1900s, but it was, but there was a lot of fighting between non-communist and communist states, with the U.S. and Soviets indirectly supporting those, or indirectly fighting each other, really, in um, in those little little wars, those proxy wars, as they're called. So, so and that because of a few people, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels specifically they came up with the idea of communism. So, you know, what would they have thought if they saw these wars happening? Who knows, they might have been happy with uh, communism trying to spread and everything like that, but, uh, you know, it's very interesting. Like, you know, how would Alexander Graham Bell look at this cell phone now? It's, you know, he'd probably be really fascinated, but uh, it would probably, whoa, probably taken aback by the steps that, you know, these turning phones like that and then suddenly uh, we have cell phones like uh, these little guys right here so it's it's very uh, very interesting idea there and um, so anyway that's what we're talking about so ideas are powerful and I want to give another example of this and <laughs> for another example of this for lack of a better term idea and um, so I just used the example of communism and how it affected Russia specifically especially, but also, you know, the world during the Cold War. And uh, and this next example takes place in Russia as well, but it, it takes long, bef it took place centuries before the Communist Revolution. So I'll just give a little background there. So um, so what happened there, in the mid-1600s, uh, Imperial Russia's religion was, was changing, or uh, rather it was lacking in the view of some. So they wanted, and in, in 1654, um, Russia had absorbed the Ukrainian uh, hetmanate, so it increased Russia's contact with the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And at this time, Russia's religious um, life was seen as, or at least the inst institutionally, it was seen as kind of um, not maybe lackluster, or or it was losing. There was priests needed more education, is what what they were saying to be to be more effective. Now, Russians had been mostly Orthodox Christians since uh, 988, when Vladimir I uh, uh, converted uh, Kiev and Rus. But, but at the same time, you know, there was, you know, there were priests and everything like that. But there was, they were just lacking some knowledge and, and education and so on. So they wanted uh, education to be able to preach more effectively. So. He, af eventually, after while following the Ukrainian and Greek religious models, which were seen as more authoritative or more correct, um, 
the Russian patriarch uh, Nikon, he he changed the Russian practices. So the core teachings remained the same. Obviously, you know, Jesus being the son of God and God being the creator, you know, the core orthodox tenets. But changes were made in so-called minor areas, like little little uh, rituals and so on. Like some words were removed from liturgy and added or whatever. But and but the, probably the biggest and most famous example is the sign of the cross was changed. It would now be done differently. While before, um, Russian Orthodox Christians were crossing themselves with two fingers like this. So it would be like this and going going to the right breast instead of the left because it's orthodox so it'd be like that so the two fingers meant the duality of christ so that's what it symbolized so one uh, or dual nature rather so of course his divine nature and then the second one would be his um his human nature but now it would be done with three fingers instead of two so it'd be like this. Yeah, I have the camera a bit too low for, for the bottom part, but you know, down to the chest and everything like that. So, so the three fingers meant instead of just having the dual dual nature of Christ, which of course was was true in Orthodox teaching, and then you also have the three because you don't want to neglect the Holy Spirit, which was to represent the Trinity. So it was a so a subtle change in a way because of just oh just add one finger. To the symbol, but but then it it brings up a whole different idea. Um, so so that's very interesting there. And so one may think that this was a minor change, and on and all the other stuff like the words removed and added and so on. While on the outside it might appear so, but in Orthodox Christianity, um, so-called everyday rituals uh, essentially recreated holy events. Or, or spiritual events. So crossing oneself was not a mere symbol or gesture. Um, and in fact, Paul uh, Boscovich, who wrote his uh, Concise History of, of Russia, which is a very interesting book, actually. Um, so Paul Boscovich said that in explaining this, he says that such actions were believed to literally, as I said, recreate the sacrifice of Christ rather than merely reminding one of it. And so this fits with the sacramental belief uh, system under Orthodoxy and, and Catholicism as well. So, and under that system, a sacrament is not merely a reflection or a religious symbolism. Uh, under this system, uh, for example, the Eucharist, or Communion, is literally the blood and body of Christ. So, while in the non-sacramental Protestant traditions, you know, Communion is, is seen as a simply a non-literal symbolism or a remembrance or a commanded ritual yes but nonetheless a symbol so it's not literally the blood and body of christ it's more seen as a symbol partaking um of christ's sacrifice uh so it you can almost say that it's seen as a 12-gun salute on remembrance or memorial day you know something like that uh, but anyway so to bring it back together here uh, so these religious reforms uh, that were happening in the mid-1600s to the Russian Orthodox Church, um, they were causing quite a stir, uh, considering that, you know, crossing oneself was not simply a, a symbol. Uh, so, in essence, uh, Nikon's reforms were Hellenizing the Russian Church. You know, the Greek cross was going to be used, Greek songs would be sung, and clergy would wear Greek uh, vestments. So, it was becoming a very... Basically, the, the Greek Orthodox Church was making more inroads to the Russian Orthodox practice, uh, which is actually kind of interesting because r the Russian religious culture owes a lot to Greek Orthodoxy anyway, because when, you know, when, again, when Vladimir I converted Kiev and Rus, they followed Greek religion at the time. So, but anyway, Nikon was criticized for these changes, and, and these changes were seen as unnecessary and arbitrary. Um, but we must understand that Russians, uh, orthodoxy was a very large part of national identity. And Russia was seen as a third Rome type, type thing. And 
the defender of the one true Christian faith. Um, and Greek orthodoxy, from which these reforms were coming, was seen as kind of lost its its lost its way um, in becoming more friendly with the Western Roman Catholic Church. So it so Greek orthodoxy was seen as a, a heretical body of belief, and so now the and since now the Russian Orthodox Church was kind of, and Russia itself was seen as the last true defender of the one true faith, or one true Orthodox faith, it was so now simply changing rituals it was an act of, you know, it was spiritual suicide. That's what it was seen as. So, to deal with this problem, Nikon and the Tsar at the time, Alexei, or Alexis, I've seen it both ways, uh, had the religious critics, including a high-ranking high-ranked priest named Abakum, Exile to Siberia. <laughs> so, exile the dissidents? Well, got rid of the problem, right? So, and in fact, in 1666, a church council was called, and it passed the Nikon's Greek reforms. So, they went ahead. So, refusing to follow them would now be a legal offense as well as a religious one. So, it was, it was a crime now. And at this point, Keep in mind that this Russian state was influencing, or it was, or the church-state relationship was was getting stronger. Um, but religious or resistance still persisted, and um, Avakum and his comrades went <laughs> kind of funny using comrades um, came to be known as the old believers, and most of these old believers were peasants and parish priests. They, they were not a whole lot of upper-class people. Uh, were old believers that stuck to the old system. Um, so, in addition to violating the new church rituals, they also didn't. They also refused to serve in the military or pay taxes. So, of course, the government's going to get involved now. And soldiers were sent to force the old believers to heal. Now, in exile in Siberia, so they didn't. The old believers didn't fight back, but they feared that the world was coming to an end. They feared that the Russian state was the Antichrist and so many old believers in kind of a despair crowded into buildings and even set themselves on fire killing themselves so that's that's very surprising you don't see a whole lot of that in Christian um, Christian history like you know not as not as much as some other faiths right so it's it's um, or not all faiths of course but it, it's very very interesting so they were that desperate so but in a way also it was a final screw you to the new religious establishment because the new religious establishment would only succeed if the old believers had actually been converted to the new greek ways or the new greek rituals so it's kind of so kind of in a way it's kind of a last um last hurrah last spite you know but um and apparently, like many thousands of old believers killed themselves in this way um, over the years, and and uh, so in 19 in 1681, sorry, uh, Avicum was eventually burned at the stake. So, so looking at all that, that's a huge amount of background there. But but you see, it's you can definitely see that ideas have power. So there's the simple. So the idea here was that the current religion. Or Russian religion was imperfect. It it needed more education, and it needed to be more along the Greek and Ukrainian lines. Well, Ukrainian Ukrainian church following the Greek ways and so on. And so, in pushing forward reform, the stage was set for religious strife, even if that wasn't the intention. the uh, The old believers also had the same had a had an idea about this as well. They thought that the old Russian ways were perfect. These were the last true ways, and many were even willing to kill themselves for this belief. Or, you know, this belief when there was no way out. So, and, you know, you look at this, and it's like, okay, you have ideas of changing some wording, you have the ideas of adding an extra um, finger to the crossing himself, oneself, and, you know, Greek vestments in the uh, for the clergy and everything like that. So, relatively simple ideas, but then you have all this other stuff, and then it, then that doesn't, that seemingly simple issue doesn't mesh with the other idea that Russia was the last bastion of ortho pure orthodoxy. So, and then you have that, and then that brings up things, well, the state 
is the Antichrist, is not the state supporting these new heretical reforms. So then people decide to not serve in the military, not to pay taxes, and then that leads to persecution. So it's, it's very interesting how one idea can stir up such a hornet's nest because so many other ideas or beliefs contradict the new ones. And of, and of course, the Russian Orthodox Church is not alone in this. Um, you know, of course, every, most everybody knows about the Protestant Reformation in the, in the 1500s under Martin Luther. It polarized Europe. And eventually, Protestants, who were the minority at the time, and, or like in, by the early 1600s, they were the minority, and definitely not, they didn't have the same rights as Catholics and so on. And eventually, this led to war. Uh, many wars. And in the late 1800s, the old, the German Old Catholic Church um, broke off from Rome because of the doctrine of papal infallibility. It had recently been pronounced, and and of course there was the Great Schism between Orthodoxy and Catholicism in the 1100s. So there's this there's this split, or 1054, I believe that was. Sorry. So there's this split over a belief, and and even now. In some non, non-Catholic non circles, there's debate on whether or not church buildings should have a kitchen. So, because people are too concerned about, or, or they're very concerned about adding or taking away from Scripture. So, they'll say, oh, well, in the old days, um, churches didn't have kitchens. Um, so, we shouldn't add a kitchen because, therefore, we are adding to doctrine and therefore being heretical. So that's what a lot of people will argue. And and of course, now we have in Islam, there's the battle between violent radicals and peaceful, you know, regular Muslims, may I say. So it's, you know, there's a lot of that, um, a lot of that stuff going on over ideas. And so like George Weigel said, the quote we started off with, Ideas do have consequences, and they're often not just idle things. They they have, a lot of them have action behind them. If they have leadership, or even, like as we see in communism, uh, Friedrich Engels and um, Karl Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto, I believe it was in the mid-1800s, and, you know, there wasn't an immediate revolution, of course, and it, it was like not for another 80 years that communists decided to take down... Um, the Russian Tsar. And so, and ideas can make people act in certain ways. And and one could argue that ideas are more powerful in some ways than the guns they sometimes command. It's, you know, because it's, because an idea will live on, while soldiers or rebels may not. Um, and so, you know, people should be responsible with their ideas of course and or at least if there's disagreement you know there should be as much as possible there should be they should be discussed and debated obviously you know there are some ideas that are just incompatible with everything else and but you know force should only be used against an idea if it causes you know great great evil so you know other than that you know it's a cool head should prevail Thank you.